So 1991 is the year that I will never forget. It was the year my only sister was murdered, three weeks before my 11th birthday. It was 4th of July weekend, and while most other kids were out enjoying fireworks, my family was dealing with the most unimaginable tragedy. My sister Jessica was nine years older than me, and like most little girls with older teenage sisters, I looked up to her. She was beautiful, she was funny, she was kind, she was smart. She was a straight-A student, and she was my role model. I'll never forget the day that my mom told me that she was gone. It was 28 years ago this July, but the thing about traumatic events is that we just never forget them. They stick in our minds. They're etched in our brains, no matter how much time goes by. I remember what I was wearing. I remember what I was doing moments before I heard the terrible news. I had eight weeks that summer to get my life back together, to get my emotions in check well enough to be able to go back to school. Because I didn't want to be different. I was 11 years old. And when you're 11 years old, all you want is to be the same. You want to wear what everybody else is wearing. You want to have what everybody else has. You want no reason to be different. When that September rolled around, everybody else was getting ready to enter sixth grade. And they were excited and happy. We were the oldest in our school at that time. And my family was getting ready for a murder trial, something that no 11-year-old should ever have to experience. I was worried that my friends from my small hometown would look at me differently. I begged my mom and dad not to tell my teachers what had happened. There was a part of me that was actually happy that it happened over the summer because I thought nobody would know I was so naive. And when I went back to school, I was just worried that my teachers would gossip about me, that I would be a source of gossip. And I didn't want anybody to think that I couldn't do it. I wanted everybody to know that I'd be OK. And when everybody came back to school that September, they were wearing their brand new backpacks, because you always go out and buy a brand new backpack for the new school year. But I had on what psychologists would re refer to as my invisible backpack. Nobody else could see it but me, and I could feel it. It was heavy, and it was filled with emotion. Grief, sadness, anxiety, fear. All of these emotions were in my backpack, and they were heavy. And I wore them to school every single day. But thankfully, I found respite in a small part of my school day. I found a teacher who cared enough about me and my family to get to know what we had been through, a teacher who got to know me so well that she knew when I needed a hug or when to be left alone. She showed me empathy. And she wasn't a school social worker or a psychologist or a guidance counselor. She was my art teacher. And the thing about art was that I didn't think I was very good at it. So you think I would hate art. But I loved to be in her space. She was always happy. She was always smiling. And she made me feel peace. It was in her space that I found peace. And it was in her space that I found a little bit of my old self, the person who had walked out of the school the June before that wasn't changed forever. It was Mrs. O'Hara. And what Mrs. O'Hara did for me that year was help me get through. It was five years later when my life started to turn upside down again. I was 16, and I was in the middle of my junior year. It was April. It was a Monday, to be exact, when the school secretary walked in to my ninth period class and told me I was not to go to my after school job that day, but I was to go to the hospital where my mom had been unexpectedly rushed. So I did just that. And that week, I had a lot of work to do. So in between visiting my mom and going to my after school job and keeping up with all the work of one's busiest high school career, the year in their, their, their high school career that's very busy, I had a big English essay due. And I was an honors English student who typically spent a lot of time on my academics. And that English essay was due, and I did what I needed to do to get it done. I handed it in, and that Friday I went to school, and paper came back and was put down on my desk by my teacher. And I remember feeling her emotions like she was disappointed in me. And I looked down, and I saw the worst grade I had ever received in my life. And it was a big, fat red D on the top of my paper. 
And I remember I quickly turned it over because I was so afraid of public humiliation. The kids sitting next to me would see my grade, as everybody did when grades came out. And I thought, they're going to think I don't belong here. They're going to think I don't belong in this honors class, that this D somehow represents my knowledge. But what they didn't know was that my life was once again in shambles, that my mom, who had become my rock after my sister died, was now in a hospital, and I had that backpack back on. I was afraid. I was anxious of what would happen to her. It, that D only represented a moment in time. That was Friday, ninth period. My mom died that night. And I remember when I came back to school following her funeral, which was about a week, I remember I was looking for two things. One was for my teacher to come and offer and express some sympathy. And the other was that she'd let me rewrite my paper. Neither of those things ever happened. And if it wasn't for this woman who taught me that sometimes it's not about the grades, it's about the learning. I probably would have marched right into that principal's office and said, I want to quit. I want out of her class. But I didn't. I stuck with it. And what I learned was that there are just some people in this world who don't care to get to know what you're going through. And I also learned that I was never going to be that person. So people ask me all the time, how do you do it, Mara? How did you do it? How did you lose your sister and five years later your mom? How did you and your dad do it? And I think the answer is resiliency and grit. The expert on grit, Angela Duckworth, describes it as a combination of three things, passion, perseverance, and stamina. And what we know about gritty people is that they just do better. They have better outcomes. But grit is not necessarily something that you're born with. Some people have it innately. But grit is something that we can absolutely get better at. We can become grittier. And that happens in our classrooms with our students and our teachers. So what does trauma have to do with grit? Well, when we think about trauma, most people think that trauma, they think of trauma as events like murder and rape. But what we know is that trauma is much more broadly defined. And the, the, the net that it casts is much wider. And in 2019, if you walk into a classroom, you'd be hard pressed to find a classroom that does not have a student who's not, who has not experienced some form of trauma. We know that trauma also creates lifelong effects. When you experience it as a child, it carries on into your adulthood. And the effects as a child the academic, the social, the cognitive, the emotional, the behavioral, it all begins so young. In fact, 50% of all lifetime anxiety cases begin by, by age eight. So what can you do? What can teachers do in classrooms to overcome this trauma? Well, we can begin by addressing the trauma that our students have been through. Get to know your kids from a psychological perspective, like Mrs. O'Hara did. She showed me empathy. She asked questions. She cared to get to know me. It's something that my high school teacher did not do. Had she known that my life was in shambles again and that I was spending my evenings at the hospital, perhaps she would have realized that I was doing the best I could at that very moment. Because what we know about schools is that that's what they are. They're moments. They're moments that are driven by emotions. Kids come to school every day with fuel tanks for learning. Some days they're full. Some days they're empty. But even on the empty days, teachers keep teaching. And we keep teaching because we know that kids can learn. They can get smarter on any given day. It's what we can teach them about getting smarter. It's the language we use in our classrooms. Saying things like, I know this is difficult for you. You'll get there. You're just not there. Not yet, but you'll get there. Don't give up, because the ability to learn is not fixed. I mentioned before that art was not one of my favorite subjects. But it was in her space, in Mrs. O'Hara's space, that I was able to find a passion. And that passion, what she found in me, was a hidden creative mind, a mind that I didn't know I had. Because in her classroom, I was able to relax. And I was able to explore my passions. And she taught me to persevere when I wanted to quit, when I thought I couldn't do a project because I didn't have that artistic talent, which, by the way, is not, a, not always related to IQ and genetically gifted talent. It's something we learn. It's something when we persevere, we get better at. And she pushed me with stamina. She told me, don't give up. And by the end of that school year, that June, I had three pieces of artwork in the art show that I was able to show off to my parents. In a year, my sixth grade year that I thought I was never going to get through, I was actually celebrated at the end. Because things aren't always what they seem. And Mrs. O'Hara knew that. See, when kids experience trauma, 
they may exhibit behaviors that we don't think they would exhibit. My English teacher, I'm sure, while she was grading my paper, thought I was just lazy, or thought I just didn't give her, her the attention to her assignment that I should have. But the fact of the matter is, when you're carrying your backpack and you're going through something traumatic, like a, an ill mom, you're anxious, you're fearful, and our brains change. Our bodies release adrenaline and cortisol, hormones that force us into a fight, flight, or freeze moment, and we do the best we can in that moment. So when kids are in our classrooms and they look chaotic or they look disorganized, it's because the chemicals in their brain have literally changed the structure and the chemistry of their brains. They're not able to process information or organize information as, like they used to. If they're getting lower test scores, it's not because they can't learn. It's because at that moment, their brain chemistry has changed. Sometimes they sit in silence or they may lash out, but all they need is a hug. So what can we do? How do we overcome all of this in classrooms? And the answer is we have to be trustworthy because I didn't trust anybody after my sister was killed. Somebody came into our lives and took her away like that. I feared everybody around me. And after my mother died, it got worse because I had doctors tell me she was going to be okay. Five minutes before she died, I had doctors tell me she was going to be okay. So I didn't trust anybody. But the thing is, we know that illnesses can't always be controlled. We know that doctors are not always miracle workers, but we can control the amount of trustworthiness we build in our classrooms. Teachers can start to build empathy in their classrooms and be honest and open with their kids and be transparent. And when you do that, you build a space where parents are honest and they come forward and share the trauma that's happening in their lives. I told you that when I went to sixth grade, I was afraid that my teachers would gossip about me. I was afraid of what everybody would say. And the bottom line is, this is our lives. It's not gossip. So if you want parents to be open and honest about what kids are going through, you have to be trustworthy to accept it. And in order to do that, we have to build physical safe spaces. We know that. We drill that all the time. But we also have to create safe mental spaces. Places where our kids feel that they can unload their backpacks and their parents can come in and share what's happening in their lives. And once all that's in place, we can empower our kids. We can empower them and hear their voices and allow them to make choices because when you're a kid going through trauma, what's happening in your life is happening to you. Everything around you is out of control. You feel very insecure. It's chaotic. And you come to school every day hoping to find a little bit of that security, hoping to feel a little bit of control. So when I think back on my high school experience, I think to myself, had only my teacher known what was happening in my life, had only she asked why I was so sad the day the secretary came in to get me. Maybe she would have said to me, you know, Mayor, you don't have to do this essay right now. Let's talk about it in two days from now and let's see how it turns out. I don't know if the outcome would have been different, but I know that I would have felt a little bit more empowered, that my voice would have been heard and I would have had a choice in the matter. That my outside of my life that was out of control, my teacher could have offered me a little bit of that stability. And most importantly, something I'm most passionate about is keeping your expectations high. Because when, ki when kids know that you have low expectations of them, they'll have low expectations of themselves. We don't need to hear teachers say, she's never going to make it, look what she's been through. I've heard that, and it hurts. Because we are capable of learning, just like all the other kids out there. Keep your expectations high, because we can become grittier. We can become resilient and we can become successful. Because sometimes when people like Mrs. O'Hara run interference in our traumatic lives, we end up becoming adults. We end up becoming people with a never give up attitude that no matter how many times people tell us we can't do it, we do it because of our attitude. Because somebody taught us how to be resilient, how to be gritty. When I was sitting in college and thinking about what I wanted to do with my career, I decided I wanted to go to law school. And the reason I wanted to go to law school was because I was going to put all the bad guys away. I was going to put people in jail so that no other child or no other family would have to go through what my family had been through. But it was in my first law class sitting there, I realized I was motivated by my trauma. And I thought about that. And I thought to myself, it's too late in the game to be putting people in jail. That's the wrong end of the equation. And it was in that law school class that I realized I didn't belong in a courtroom putting people away 
in jail. I belonged in a classroom putting kids on the path to success. And sometimes, when all these things happen in our schools, and sometimes when you have teachers who believe in you, you can create and grow into a successful, fulfilled adult. We get married. We have children of our own. And we even become doctors. And when we do, you'll want to be remembered as the teacher who helped us persevere. You want to be remembered as the teacher who put us on the path to success. You won't want to be remembered as the teacher who almost made us quit. People like Mrs. O'Hara, people who change the narrative from that's all she can do to I wonder what she can do next. Teachers like Mrs. O'Hara. Sometimes in our lives we need teachers who change the narrative from that's all she can do to let's see what she can do next. Teachers like Mrs. O'Hara. Thank you.